Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for taking time on your, on your Saturday morning to, to come and to be part of our first uh, town hall meeting on the future of the United Methodist Church. And we're going to be talking about the, the Methodist Church's relationship to the LGBT community and, uh, and looking at kind of different ways of framing and understanding this uh, this kind of hot button issue in our culture these days that in churches. Um, I want to begin, I've got some kind of preliminary remarks I want to make, but I wanted to begin by reading once again from uh, John 17. Uh, this, uh, I preached on this about a month ago or two, uh, but, but this is Jesus' prayer for his disciples. It's kind of the longest prayer that we have in scripture that's recorded uh, for the disciples. And I uh, just want to remind you that his, the heart of this prayer, I'm not going to read all of it, but I want to read part of it, is that the people of God, the disciples of Jesus, would be one, that we would be united with one another. Now, that's a, that's a tall order, <laughs> um, especially in a day like ours, where we live in a culture that's so deeply divided on really fundamental things. But um, let's just let this be sort of our opening prayer uh, for our time together this morning. problem. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus, thank you for praying that prayer. And I pray that you would protect us in your name, and that you would give us guidance and wisdom. We know, Lord, that your word tells us that uh, if any of us lack, lacks wisdom, we can ask God and receive it. And so today, we're here asking for wisdom. We're asking that your Holy Spirit would guide us, that you would help us to know the way forward. We want to be the church that you have called us to be. We want to be a church that is faithful to the scriptures, that is um, loving and filled with a desire to include those that the world might exclude. Help us as your church to be, to be your people and to walk in faithfulness. And Lord, it may be the case this morning uh, and on down the road that some of us may disagree with one another. Help us, Lord, to be able to state our disagreements but to not become disagreeable people. Help us, Lord, to, to, um, to be able to have conversation with one another, to see each other as human beings face to face in a world where that's just so very rare. Um, thank you, Lord, for this group, uh, this core group in this church that wants to be uh, a representative of your love to the community of Glassford and the surrounding towns. Uh, and so we pray for your guidance and for your wisdom this morning. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want you all to know, first of all, that I didn't pick this fight. <laughs> okay? Um, this is something that's been brewing for, for quite a long time in uh, the Methodist Church. And um, uh, for better or worse, there's just been disagreement about uh, issues surrounding LGBT inclusion and and by the way, for those of you who may not know what that stands for, um, oh, this is my, everyone, this is my friend Bill Novak, I should say Reverend Bill Novak. He's the new, uh, well, going to be the new associate pastor at Morton United Methodist. So I've asked him to come and share a few minutes with us today, but Bill's a good friend of mine. I'm excited to have him in the area. So, <clears throat> um, so the, the United Methodist Church was begun in, um, 1968, and I'm just curious, how long do you think it took before we started debating this issue at our annual conferences? It was beyond in 1968. Anybody want to guess a year? 70s. The 70s. It was it was 1972. So it was it was the we meet for general conference every four years. It was the very next general conference. It was starting to be debated in 1972, and we've been debating it. As a, as a Methodist family 
um, for uh, you know ever since, ever since, and it's kind of become more intense, and uh, we've sort of been kicking the can down the road for a while, um, but the time has come, and uh, I'll be honest. I told some other church leaders I was doing this. I was wanting to just my this is my style as a pastor. I would really I rather just deal with stuff and get it out there and talk about it than to uh, sweep it under the rug and pretend like it doesn't exist. And that's just kind of my style. I, I, I find that it's a little bit, you know, it might, it, maybe, it, maybe it'll be a mistake. I have not done this before either. I hope it won't be. I hope that what we can do is, is kind of learn from each other a bit and come to a better understanding of each other's perspectives on this. Um, but I want, I want to remind you that what we have here is a very sacred responsibility. It's one that we need to take very seriously. The church is, of course, uh, such an important institution in our communities. It communicates to people what we value and what we believe in. Um, for those of you who've grown up here in Miss Glassford UMC, um, this is the church of, of not only your own family, but probably of your parents, maybe even of your grandparents. Um, these are traditions that are very sacred and very important to us. And we, have, we are at a, a moment in history where we just have to make some decisions. And, uh, and we're going to try to find the best way forward together. My, my style is not, um, well, I'm the pastor. You better get on board with me, or you can just get off the train. That's, that's not the way that it is for me. Um, my style is instead, I, I, this, is, this is our church, OK? This is our church. In fact, I would say that in some sense, it's more your church than it is my church, all right? You're the ones that have been here for decades. You're the ones that are gonna be here for decades later, even after I'm reappointed somewhere else. So it, this is not me saying, this is how it's gonna be, y'all better get on board. No, it's, it's me saying, I wanna help guide you as you try to make a, a tough decision. Um, and I wanna try to let you be, have an informed decision to understand what these issues are so that you can, you know, make a wise uh, choice in, in, in leading. Now, here's the, here's the thing. Uh, we're going to get into some theology, and I'm going to do some teaching today, and some of it might be a little bit more in-depth than you want. Pardon me if that, that becomes the case. But uh, what I want you to keep in mind is the reason we're doing this is it's not, this isn't about a, a theological issue. It isn't about um, debating some some sort of like scriptural interpretation, it, it does involve that. It's fundamentally, it's about people. It's about people. And because what we decide to do as a church is going to impact people. And I was reminded of this, actually, just, uh, just a month ago when I was greeting some people after, after the service. And uh, one, one uh, rather new attender had come with his granddaughter and I noticed she had a little button on that, that indicated uh, they, them, which is a way of saying that, that her pronouns, her per, I should say their preferred pronouns is they, them. Now that may be new and different to a lot of us, to not refer to people as he or she. And you may not agree with the, this idea that people can pick their own pronouns. We won't get into that right now, but my point was that they said to me, am I welcome here? And I just, uh, I'm gonna say, I gave them a big hug and I said, Jesus loves you just as you are. All of us are sinners in need of grace. And, um, and, and, and that was that, but it reminds me that, that what this church decides to do and how it decides to approach people who are different, people who are, identify as part of that community, the LGBT community, um, what are we going to communicate to them? Are, are we going to communicate that they're welcome? Now, now so far, so far the Methodist Church has, has said absolutely gay people are welcome in the church. That's not a question. Um, they can, gay people can come and they can sit in our pews and sing songs with us and listen to our preaching and receive the sacraments. That's not even been a question, okay? The question has come down to two, really two main things. Um, one is, should we marry gay people in the church? 
Um, and should we ordain uh, openly practicing homosexuals as pastors, as bishops, and as leaders in the church? Those are the kind of the two sticking points that the church just simply can't agree on. And, uh, and so I'm going to get into some of this, um, but I'll tell you, uh, my church up in Evanston, uh, the church that the girls still attend, it's called Reva Place Church, they, what they did is, because their church was divided as well, they had people on both sides, and, and, they, and there were strong feelings on both sides, they actually spent four years as a church, they're not a United Methodist Church, so they weren't under the gun or anything like that in terms of timing. But they took four years where they had Bible studies, they read books together, they spent time in prayer together, trying to discern God's will for that church. And whatever they decided, it doesn't matter. I just respected the process so very much that they were willing to invest the time and the thought and the prayer towards understanding both sides of things. Well. This morning, this is my attempt to kind of introduce the subject matter and to introduce like different ways of seeing this. Because there are reasons that Christians are divided over this. And it really has to do with sort of how we, uh, how, how we do theology. But I'm, I'm, I'm getting my, ahead of myself just a little bit. So, but here's the, here's the difficulty about having these conversations. First of all, it's kind of a political topic. So it's already sort of divided in our culture politically. Secondly, it's, it's, it's also a very personal topic. Some of us may have very close friends who identify as gay or lesbian. Some of us may have family members who identify as gay and lesbian. Um, you know, so there, for all I know, some of us might feel that, that, they, that right here this morning, that, that you may be gay or lesbian, but you've just never been able to, to communicate that, right? Um, and so it's very personal, it's very political, uh, it, it's deeply religious, it gets to our understanding of, of what it means to be a Christian. Um, and so um, that's like, like I, like I said last Sunday, it's like the perfect storm in a way. Like all of these, you know, they, they've said before, um, avoid religion and politics at the dinner table. Have you heard that before? <laughs> or when you get together with your family for Thanksgiving, you know, just don't talk religion and politics. Well, um, this issue, it, it covers all of that. And so it, it may create in us, you know, kind of a passionate response. And I want to say that that's okay. If it creates a passionate response from you, that, that is okay because um, it does get to some of the core issues of what we believe. Um, but hopefully, as I've said many times, we can, we can learn to kind of disagree without getting disagreeable. Ultimately, that's the goal here, uh, that we can hear each other out, and we can have these conversations, and we can learn together. And by the way, let me just remind you that at the core of the Christian faith is the virtue of humility. You know what I mean by humility, right? And part of being humble means looking at something from a new angle and asking ourselves, have I been wrong about this? And I mean that for, for anybody on any side. Okay, um, to, to be willing to say, and this is not an easy thing to do, by the way, to say, well, you know what? My folks, they were good folks. They raised me in the faith, but maybe they were wrong about this. Or maybe, maybe they just didn't see things the way that we see things now because uh, they lived in a different time and there were different attitudes and cultural, cultural attitudes. Um, I'm not saying necessarily they are wrong, but I'm, I'm saying that that we have to have the humility in us to be able to, to, to examine our own beliefs. Okay, so that is, here, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to, I'm going to just sort of lay my cards on the table. I'm going to tell you my story. I'm gonna tell you my experience, how I was raised and how I've come to certain conclusions now. And, and just to let you know where I stand because I think it's best for me as your pastor to just to just be transparent with where I stand, okay? And you guys can agree or disagree with me, but I'm going to try to explain why I've come to the conclusions that I have. Um, just in terms of format today, what I'm gonna do is go from, we're gonna go from like from nine to 10, do a one hour session, then we'll take a break, 
Uh, take 15 minutes. Uh, we can go get a drink or whatever. There's a book table in the back to look at. Just mingle all that. Then we'll come back and we'll do a final session. And um, I'll, at the very, very latest, I'll have you out of here by 11.30. I don't think we'll go that full time. But just, just so you know kind of the, the format of it. And, um, and some of you may want to like take notes or whatever. Some of this is going to sound a little bit like a classroom. But that's because I think part of my job as a pastor is to sort of help you to understand what the issues are and, and to educate you. And we're also going to have frequent times to stop and to talk and to hear what you have to say. So um, this isn't just going to be me talking at you for a couple hours. I, I really do want it to be a conversation. But let me just start off with a little bit of our history as, as a church. So you guys know that I love history, and, and, and uh, I studied a lot of Methodist history. Um, basically, the, uh, basically, Methodism began in the 1730s with a man named John Wesley and his brother Charles and a few of their friends uh, back in England at Oxford. And they said, hey, you know, by asking each other tough questions and meeting together in small groups, we can become better Christians. They were concerned with being better Christians, earnest Christians. And so, um, and they developed a kind of method of asking each other questions. And I won't get into all of that, but uh, that's why they were, uh, they were dubbed Methodists. It was kind of a derogatory term. People were making fun of them <laughs> uh, because they had all their methods. But these guys were serious about being the best Christians, the best Christ followers that they could. Well, Methodism spread. It started growing in England. And by about the 1770s, it came to the United States, which were, at the, you know, at the time, colonies of, of England. Uh, Methodist missionaries were sent. So uh, in 1784, um, that, was, that was when the Americans decided to form their own Methodist church. And it was called the Methodist Episcopal Church. And um, it, it started at a thing called the Christmas Conference. Our first bishop was a man named Francis Asbury. And um, Methodism really took off like wildfire in the United States, um, even more so than it had in England and in Ireland. Um, and it, 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 uh, it, it spread very, very quickly. Um, and by, but here's, here's the thing I want you to know now. The church started, starts in 1784. The first split, <laughs> the first church split took place in 1792. So uh, Methodism has always sort of, um, this, is a, this has happened before. That's what I'm wanting to say, is that church splits do happen um, because of basic disagreements about core issues. Now, I don't think any of us rejoice in the fact of a church split. Um, we want, it's, it's a kind of a last resort for a church to do that. Um, but the point being that there were, there were splits almost from the very beginning over certain issues. Um, originally, this, this was really about um, should, should the church have bishops or not? Should, should there be just local congregations that are in charge or should we keep, you know, pastors and bishops um, as, in an Episcopal authority over the church? So, um, Anyway, this, this continued on, the church continued to spread, and then uh, we get to a time in 1844 when the Methodist Church in America split deeply. This, this was a split right in half, and uh, anybody know, want to guess what that, the issue was that split the church so deeply in 1844? Slavery. Slavery. Slavery, exactly. Now, the thing about that is that, of course, uh, you had, you had really, what, what happened is there was a geographic difference, right? Like the South became the Methodist Episcopal Church South, the MECS. The North just remained the Methodist Episcopal Church. And so there was a geographic split. Um, and, 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 by, and by the way, um, just 17 years later, after the Methodist Church split, Civil War broke out. And historians believe that it was the splitting of the churches uh, a couple decades before that actually kind of led to the Civil War and contributed to the Civil War. Because when the churches couldn't hold together anymore, the nation couldn't hold together anymore. Now, I think that should be a kind of sobering reminder for us as the church today 
that in a sense, our country, it's, it's deeply divided. It's deep, you guys know this. It's deeply divided, more than it's ever been in any of our lifetimes. And, um, and when the churches can't hold together, uh, nations fall apart. That's, that's kind of the underlying lesson from, from 1844. So uh, these churches split, and of course we fought the Civil War in the 1860s, um, and eventually um, Methodism rejoined altogether and became one united church again. Um, uh, although they, they, they certainly had their issues. Um, and, 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 this, and then that leads all the way up to this, this reunited church uh, later would lead to 1968 when the United Methodist Church was formed. And, and it was taking Methodism, all the, all the Methodist churches, it was also including some other traditions that were in, interested in joining called the Evangelical United Brethren. Uh, anybody heard of the Brethren? Church of the Brethren? Yeah, they, they became part of the United Methodist Church. And, and so the United Methodist Church has been uh, the product of that. But here's, here's the point, is in all of this, the church, Methodism has always been a movement. Um, it has always been um, a powerful movement used by the Holy Spirit for doing good in our, in our country and in our world. Um, but it has also experienced division before. So this is not uh, entirely new, what we're facing right now. Um, and so the, the topic, of, as I mentioned, the topic of homosexuality came up in 1972 at uh, really the first and general conference just after we had formed. I just want to read for you a little bit about what our book of discipline, I, I didn't bring the book of discipline with me, but the thing that binds us all together as United Methodists is, is in our book of discipline. And our Book of Discipline has statements about these LGBT issues. Uh, let me just read to you a few of the statements from the, from the Book of Discipline. It says, sexuality is God's good gift to all persons. We call everyone to, to responsible stewardship of this sacred gift. Although all persons are sexual beings, whether or not they are married, sexual relations are affirmed only within the covenant of monogamous heterosexual marriage. Okay, that's our, that's our current statement. Um, uh, the, the idea is that, that, that sex isn't evil, first of all, and the church has kind of sometimes misarticulated that to people. Sex is not bad, it's good. It's something God has created um, for our benefit, for our pleasure, for the propagation of the species, for everything, it's, all, it's good. But it has to stay within its proper bounds, right? And the proper boundaries of our sexuality should be within marriage. And the way the Methodist Church has, has said it now is that it should be within monogamous, committed relationships of two people of the opposite sex. That's where, that's where our position has been. Marriage is defined as one man and one woman. That's our current position as, as the United Methodist Church. We also say in the Book of Discipline that all persons and individuals are of sacred worth created in the image of God. So, whether you're straight or gay or black or white or Democrat or Republican or however else you want to slice it, you're of sacred worth. You are of infinite value. The image of God has been stamped upon you and nothing can take that away. Um, that's what we believe. We affirm that God's grace is available to all we will seek to live together in Christian community, welcoming, forgiving, and loving one another as Christ has loved and accepted us. We implore families and churches to not reject or condemn lesbian and gay members and friends. We commit ourselves to be in ministry with and for all persons. Okay, so that's in our book of discipline. Our book of discipline tells us that we're not supposed to reject or condemn gay people just because they're gay, all right? Um, look, this is what it boils down to. All of us are sinners, okay? Every single one of us. All of us stand in, the need, in need of the grace of God. There aren't some special sins that are like, that trump all the other sins. That just isn't the way that it works. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, for a long time, homosexuality has been something that's rather easy to beat up on. Preachers can beat up on that because maybe they don't feel that particular temptation themselves anyway. And so it's easy to, to sort of point the finger and to condemn. But, but
But of course, the preachers who do that need to, need to look at themselves in the mirror first, right? That, that they too, maybe that's not their issue that they struggle with, but that they too stand on the need of God's grace. And so the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Have you heard that before? It's true. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And we are all in need of grace. And so our book of discipline uh, communicates that for us. Just a little bit more that I want to read from it. Certain basic human rights and civil liberties are due all persons. We are committed to supporting those rights and liberties for all persons, regardless of sexual orientation. We see a clear issue of simple justice in protecting the rightful claims where people have shared material resources, pensions, guardian relationships, mutual powers of attorney, and other such lawful claims typically attendant to contractual relationships. What they're saying here is that we don't believe that anybody ought to be a second-class citizen in our country, okay? We don't believe that, um, that because of a sexual orientation or because of a race or because of whatever, that that then makes them inferior or less than everybody else. We should all have the same rights and privileges and, and, and obligations to our democracy. Um, so this is what the Book of Discipline says, but once again, currently, as it stands, the Book of Discipline says, marriage is defined as one man and one woman, okay? And that's where we draw the line. Uh, now, in recent years, the United Methodist Church has started to really disagree about that definition of marriage. And so, um, I'm just going to kind of, um, you, have, uh, you have United Methodists, and, and here's, the, here's the tough thing about being United Methodist. United Methodism, more than almost any other denomination in the country, is a, is an, is a national organization. It's, it can be found everywhere in the country. So it can be found in cities. It can be found in the country. It can be found in the north. It can be found in the south. It is, it's all over the place. Now, uh, Lutherans, for example, if you look like uh, geographically where the Lutherans are, they're almost all in kind of like the upper Midwest and the Midwest region of the country because of immigration patterns from Scandinavia and Germany and stuff like that. Um, Southern Baptists, obviously concentrated in the South. United Methodists are different because we, we have churches in Boston, Massachusetts, and we have churches in Biloxi, Mississippi, all right? And we have churches in, in Glassford, Illinois. And so um, it's difficult to get people of that wide of a variety of places to agree on something. And so, you go up to a United Methodist Church, and for better or worse, you go up to a United Methodist Church up in Chicagoland, it's going to be a very, very different experience <laughs> than the United Methodist Church here in Glassford, okay? Or if you go to one in the Bible Belt in the South, it's going to be a very different experience than um, in some, you know, really progressive area of the country, like in Portland, Oregon, or something. Um, there, and, and holding this together has been tough, but what's happened is that people kind of on the left end of the spectrum, uh, which we call, by the way, we call them affirming. And I'm going to use that term at times. So really, it's affirming and, uh, and traditional. All right. Um, affirming people have started to say, and they've been doing this for a while, you know what? The Book of Discipline is wrong. We're not going to follow it anymore. And so there have been pastors that have gone ahead and they've had wedding ceremonies between same-sex couples in United Methodist churches. Okay? That's just happened. Um, whether they should have done that or shouldn't, we won't, we won't talk about that right now. But affirming also, and this is really kind of um, why everything sort of hit the fan recently, is that one of our bishops in the United Methodist Church is an openly practicing lesbian, okay? She's the bishop of uh, uh, the West Mountain Sky. Mountain Sky Conference. Yeah, that's where Bill just came from. Um, and so, uh, you know, back in 1844, back when slavery was the issue, they were, everybody was kind of willing to look the other way until finally a slaveholder became a bishop. And when a slaveholder became a bishop, people just 
lost it. And they said, this is, we're not going to go with it. Okay. Well, the same sort of thing has now happened in the UMC just in the last few years by having an openly gay, um, and, and you know, she's not celibate. By the way, that, that is, the conservative position is that you, the orientation, being gay isn't, isn't sinful, it's acting on it, okay? That's the position of a traditionalist. Um, but here we have a bishop who's, who's open about it and who's practicing in it. And so that, that's obviously a, a, a kind of a form of division. So this is what's happened is that things have s sort of escalated where people on the affirming side are kind of being more bold and they're breaking the rules, they're, they're violating the book of discipline. And meanwhile, traditionalists are getting really, really angry about it and saying, look, these, they're violating our, our one document that we all agree on. They're not following the rules. And the traditionalists are absolutely right about that. The, and they're, they're right to be upset about it because if we're not going to follow the rules, what's holding us together? Okay? Um, and, but people, people on the affirming side really believe it's a matter of justice and that they're doing the right thing and it's kind of like a, a deliberate breaking of the rules for, for a better purpose. That's the way it's, it's seen. Um, okay. All of this kind of happened, all of this was kind of brewing until um, February of, uh, of 2019. Very, very recent. Um, I don't know, do any of you remember that there was a special session of General Conference? It was held down in St. Louis, okay? And it was in February of 2019, so not very long ago. And this special session, they were going to finally have the vote, the big vote. And everybody could cast their vote, all the delegates. By the way, at, at General Conference, half of the delegates are clergy, half of the delegates are lay people. Okay? That's the way it's always been for Methodists. We want, we want both to have a voice. And so that's why, for example, this year, uh, Jenny went to our annual conference as our delegate from this church. Um, she spoke on behalf of the lay people of this congregation. Anyway, we all gathered in St. Louis in February of 2019, and you guys would not believe how close the vote was. Okay, it was a nail biter. Nobody knew what was going to happen. But the way that it ended up um, is that, let's see, I want to make sure I get this right. 53% um, voted for the traditional plan. 47 voted for the affirming plan. So you can see how close that is. Those are the percentages. Um, now, and there's a lot of, oh my, there's a lot of politics and stuff behind all of this. <laughs> we won't get into all of that. I mean, well, you guys know, you've been United Methodist for a while. <laughs> you know, it can get political. And, and, and there were campaigns and, and all of this. And um, one of the controversies is that there's a large uh, African delegation. Okay, there are a lot of United Methodists in Africa. Now, Africa is, as uh, generally speaking, is a more conservative, more traditional, uh, holds to a more traditional view of marriage. And so because of all the African delegates' votes, the traditionalists ended up winning. If it had been just delegates from the United States of America, the affirming side would have won, okay? So this is what happened in 2019, and I had some friends that came back to Garrett, and they were, they were really, really devastated by this. I had, I had other friends. Um, who were elated, finally, um, we, we, you know, the conservatives have won on this. It's, it's, this is just the state of the church that we're in right now, and so I'm just being very honest with you that, that it's, it's almost split like right down the middle. And, and, and it might be that even as a local congregation that we, we will find uh, that the split can be found even within our own, within our own church. Um, and so, what, what we're all praying for is for the Holy Spirit to move and to help us to understand things better, what God wants for us. But what's happened since 2019 is that the affirming side has started to form sort of their own network of churches, and they call it the, uh, the LMX for short, uh, the Liberation Methodist Connection. I'm not sure quite why they did an X in the connection, but anyway. Um, and, and, and so they're forming this. There's also a group that's been around for a little while. 
called the Reconciling Ministries Network, uh, where United Methodist churches that have decided as a congregation, uh, and pastor included, that they, are, they want to be pro-LGBT, they want to be affirming and inclusive, they want to be uh, able to marry same-sex couples, um, then they're part of the Reconciling Ministries Network and the United Methodist Church. Um, and so this organization has grown. Well, on the traditionalist side, they've also been organizing. Um, and right now, as I was sharing with you a few weeks ago on, uh, in, our, in our society meeting, the, uh, the Global Methodist Church is forming. Uh, it has been formed, it has officially been formed for just a couple of months, or at least they've got their logo now and everything. And so churches that are committed to being traditionalist and committed to being, um, uh, yeah, committed to being on the traditionalist side are, are some, some are disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church. And there's a process for this. They're disaffiliating and they're joining the global Methodist Church. Um, which is going to be founded on traditionalist principles. So um, there's also there's an organization called the WCA, Wesleyan Covenant Association. And it has been working for quite some time uh, to organize traditionalists and to get them together. And they are kind of the driving engine behind the Global Methodist Church. Now, nobody really knows what is going to happen to the United Methodist Church. Um, and so what's happening right now is that generally churches that are on the very far left are leaving and churches that are on the very far right are leaving, okay? Now, not all of them, but then there's this wide group in the middle that where they're just, they're not quite sure. Maybe their church is kind of divided over the question. Um, they haven't come to a solid conclusion. Uh, it, it largely depends on where the church is located too. You know, if it's a church in a blue state, in a blue city, and it's very progressive, well, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer for some of those churches. Well, obviously, we're going to go with the progressives. And there are those churches, of course, that are in, you know, red state, Bible belt, God's country. It, you know, they're, they're, going to, they're going to go with the traditionalists, and that's a no-brainer. Then there are the rest of us that are what I would call, like, the purple churches. That, you know, we, we are people that, that there are both. There are both perspectives within the church. And look, we love one another. We want to remain together as a church. And, um, you know, God help the purple churches. Because it's one of the only places left in our country where people of different opinions can actually meet with one another and talk with one another and, you know, care for one another. So it, I think it's really, really important. But that's why we're having this conversation. These are, these are kind of where the battle lines are drawn a little bit. Um, so rest assured, the coming division, uh, it's not going to mean, uh, and please hear me on this, it's not going to mean the denomination is going to come and, and take away our, our resources, our buildings, our bank accounts. Uh, that's not going to happen. And, and I understand why there might be a fear of that. Um, but the, 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 the Illinois Great Rivers Conference in particular that we're a part of is working very, very hard to make sure that local churches suffer very little from this. And, and some of them are choosing. Uh, the largest church in our conference uh, down in Belleville, Illinois, uh, just disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church, means they're no longer a part of our, our conference. Now, they did that by, by paying lawyers and and uh, doing the whole legal battle on their own. It, they, they're a conservative congregation. They know they want to remain a conservative congregation. They don't want to have any part of, of what's going on in the UMC, and so they want to become their own thing. So they, they paid a lot of money, I'm assuming, um, for, for lawyers and stuff, and, and sued for rights to their building and property and all of that, and they are now just an independent church. That is an option. That is an option that churches are looking at, just becoming an independent church. Um, I would personally discourage that uh, myself because I think there's a really powerful and strong, um, uh, there, are a lot, there, there are a lot of benefits to belonging to a connectional system, okay? And, and that's, that's what we are in as a United Methodist Church is 
we are connected in fellowship with Whitechapel, you know? We're connected with, with, uh, with University United Methodist Church in Peoria. We're connected together, and there are so many benefits to being connected like that, to being one body. But some churches are deciding to leave that connection and to just be, become their own thing. Um, and then they might then later decide to become a, a global Methodist church or you know, other churches might decide to, to associate with a, lot, with a liberation Methodist connection. So um, right now the, the Illinois Great Rivers Conference is trying to do all that it can to be responsible to recognize that this, this division is coming. Um, and so they are setting up what's called disaffiliation protocols for each church so that there's a process that if you decide you want to leave the United Methodist Church as a congregation, here's how you do it. Do step A, B, and C, okay? Um, I hope it doesn't come to that, personally. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be a Methodist, and I'm glad to be a part of the connection of Methodism. Um, but, you know, that is an option if things get, if things get bad. Um, so the, the main point of all of this is that church splits happen, and this is kind of where we're at. Um, and, and I just wanted to sort of bring you all up to date on, you know, that, that's, that's just 30 minutes on like a brief history of like where we're at now. So um, let me just stop there and ask if there are any questions or thoughts that you would all like to share in light of all of this. Not to my knowledge, not like in the Illinois River District or anything like that, yeah. Um, to be honest, we are, I think we are the first church in our area to actually try to tackle this. Um, we're, we're grabbing the bull by the horns, that's how I put it. Um, and a lot of, I think a lot of pastors see it as a kind of hot potato that I'd rather not touch, and I understand that. I totally get that. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because I think, actually, this is such a healthy church in so many ways. I think that if we can do this well and have this process unfold, it could be a great benefit to the other local churches in the area. Kingston Mines, you know, these other little churches, they might be looking to Glassford UMC to say, well, what did they decide? What did they do? Did they do? How, did they, how did they land on this? Um, but yeah, at this point, we haven't had any uh, United Methodist churches in this area disaffiliate, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. What's the, kind of like our Christian hang-up in our pulpit? Have they said what they're feeling about this work? You know, um, that's a great question. Uh, I have not heard them state clearly where they land on this. And to be honest, it. Uh, between you and me, that, that's a little frustrating to me. I would. Because they didn't have a job over here. Well, I, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, politicians like to kind of play it safe and answer the question they'd rather was asked. <laughs> I, I think church leaders can be that way a bit. Like, they're wanting to, they're wanting to be a uniter. And so I've tried to press them on certain things, and they're kind of ambiguous and just kind of beat around the bush a little bit. And I'm not saying that. I think the time will come where they will have to say, this is where I'm at, okay? But I just don't think that they're there yet. I kind of agree with that. I think they say, they feel split. They say, Chris, you know, I'm your superintendent. You know, you are part of my plot. This is how I believe, you know, we should do some of the guidelines for the church we hope to follow. I, I hear you, and I, 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 I'm inclined to agree with you, Bob. I am. It's a good, and you know, maybe, maybe some of us need to need to write a letter or something to the superintendent. Just say, hey, we just. Yeah, yeah, you may be right about that. I believe you on that. So, I mean, no, thanks, thanks for bringing that up, though. That it's a great question. They are, and that's their that's their job, isn't it? I agree. Yeah, Jenny.
Yeah. So, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind as we navigate this. Okay. Absolutely right. We need to keep in mind. Yeah, out of out of 800 churches, mm -hmm. only two have disaffiliated so far. So, yeah, Dwayne. Uh, really quick about the Methodist Church in Los Angeles. I have family that are still in the Methodist Church, and they both have started their own church. And I believe in this overarching total government. There's a spirit. lot to me. Uh, Len, let me just say that uh, this has, uh, oh man, I've shed tears over this. I don't, you know, I hate to see churches split. Um, none of us enjoy that. Um, but this is one of the challenges that for one reason or another God has put in our path. And I believe if we do it right, if we pray together, talk together, try to reason with one another, we can actually come out on the other end even stronger as a family. And that's my hope and prayer. Two options. Yeah. Well, that's. I, I think that really is what we're we're going to try to decide together. We haven't reached that point, we haven't reached that point yet, right? Yeah. And so we're, you know, right now what I'm what I'm going to do on our second half today is to kind of give you the arguments for both sides, so that you guys can hear them and be thinking about them. Um, and we're not going to do like an official vote today or anything like that. I am going to do a, an unofficial. Um, poll, because I just want to kind of know where you're all at. And it'll be completely anonymous, uh, but I just, it'll help me as a pastor to know how better to prepare. Here's the main thing I want you all to know, is no matter how this church chooses to vote, I'm committed to being your pastor, okay? And I'm committed to following, following the discipline that we choose to adopt. Um, but it, like I said, it's your church, you know? You're the lay people, you're the ones who are the stable, uh, you know, long-term folk here in, in Glassford. So it's your church. So I will pastor you, but I want you to be able to make an informed decision. So, yeah. Yeah, Danny, did you have something you want to say? Uh, I've been, you know, past Dwayne Maker and also at the, the backup, you know, from the East Village Conference. So... I know the uh, Jason at the 374 stadium, and especially when what I was reading this year that three of our small, which is probably older congregations in our district have started. And I was, you know, involved in the church. Yeah. Go ahead. What two churches are you referred to in our area right now? St. David's and uh Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just wondered 
Was it the small congregation? Yeah, yeah, yeah St. David's yeah. small. Because I, they, uh, I don't know if they wasn't, that, wasn't that a Methodist church up in Texas Road? Yes, Texas is also another one. Yeah. That's what I was trying to look up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and and this is something we have to think about is that Methodism in general is aging. <coughs> um, the churches are are heavy on, on senior citizens and light on young people. And um, one of the things we have to think about is why are young people rejecting the church? Um, and, and I'll just tell you that from my experience, there is a generational divide over this question. And that young people are much more lean on the affirming side uh, and older folk more on the traditional side for obvious reasons. Um, probably so. It's always been that way. Yeah. <laughs> That's life. Yes, exactly. That's right. That's right. So, it, yeah, Bev, you had a... East Peoria Faith. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The other one, the other one that, that closed. Okay, yeah. And you know, that, that does happen. That's that's a part of the churches they have a lifespan and they eventually some of them reach the end, uh, which is always sad to see a church close. Um, but that's why we also are, are trying as a conference to plant churches, you know, start new ones. So um, but you know, we have to face the facts and the facts are that that the United Methodist Church has for quite a while been in a fairly steady decline. And, um, you know, I have some thoughts that I'll share with you eventually about, like, why I think that that is. But um, I do believe that how we process this could matter a lot to how appealing our church will be to younger families. Um, and I'm not, you know, young people are divided as well. I'm not saying it's, it's plain, simple, one way or another. But, but that's why we have a heavy responsibility right now because a lot, a lot rides on us. So, any other? Oh yes, Heather. Just from a perspective, um, like how long has been the standard of living in the United States of America? Do you know the answer? That's a great question. I believe it wasn't until the 1970s. Bill, do you know? Ordination for women. Ordination for women. In the 50s. Yeah, pretty much since the beginning of the UMC, yeah. Um, that has been uh, actually earlier. There, there have been United uh, African American pastors in the UMC since the beginning of the, the church in '68. Yeah, um, but there's also a whole history of. I mean, we're not squeaky clean in that history either. <laughs> so, yes, Mar. That's a great question. That is a great question, and I've I've wondered that myself. Um, I think that there are there are people that that see they see this as a as a as an abomination, as a as a true evil in the mid, in the church, and they just want nothing to do with it. And so they see a, a lesbian bishop, or they see a pastor perform a same sex wedding in the United Methodist Church. And there's a kind of gut reaction of, I want nothing to do with that. I want to get out of this as soon as I can. And when you have a whole church that feels that way, then you get what we've seen of, of disaffiliating churches going to the right. But it, it, that's, a, that's a good, do you, you have a thought on that, Bill?
going to in our second half today I want to get into like some of the theology stuff but I taught my when I taught up at Garrett I taught my class that to think of it as like a as an archery or a, a bullseye thing that in Christianity there are the, the very core central things uh, that we would call uh, dogma uh, the, well that's the Catholic phrase for it but dogma are the sort of non-negotiables that as, a, as Christians we cannot sacrifice so you can't give up, uh, uh, for example, what's in the Apostles' Creed. And I've had us recite that before, that, you know, uh, born of a virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Okay, that's like central stuff, the resurrection of Jesus. Um, then you get into doctrine, and doctrine is kind of a second level where churches disagree with one another. Say, for example, Methodists believe in free will, and Presbyterians believe in predestination. Okay, that's a question of doctrine. Um, and then on the, on the farthest outer edge, you get um, opinion. And uh, opinion is like, you know, uh, anything we might fight over in the church. <laughs> I mean, you know, like the color of the carpet. I mean, the, you know, very unimportant things, right? Peripheral things, right? And so the problem is that um, uh, for a lot of what Bill is saying is that for a lot of conservatives, um, we have some bishops that deny basic things like the resurrection of Jesus that are central. And honestly, um, the question of LGBT, it's a very important question, but it's, it's odd that it's the one that's dividing us because I would plot it somewhere, somewhere in this range. Uh, it's round doctrine to opinion. It's actually not central and core to w what we believe as Christians. So there's a kind of, there's a kind of a, matter of priority and importance and it's interesting that what we're dividing over is something that's kind of out here rather than something that's right down here because this is what really you know that's that's where you get fight that's where it's worth fighting over in my opinion um out here it's like live and let live I, that's my attitude but um yeah anyway we'll 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 get into um we'll get into some of the theology here in a bit because I, what i want to do with the rest of the day is just to give you guys the basic arguments from both sides on this. But um, let me just say a word of prayer, and let's just take a, a short break and just talk with each other and mingle for a bit. Lord Jesus, we're here trying to do holy work. We're trying to follow your will. We, we want to know how, as a church, we can love you more and pursue your kingdom more. Uh, our hearts are grieved and heavy at the divisions that are within our denomination, but we know that your kingdom uh, is far bigger and far greater, and that nothing, absolutely nothing, will stop your kingdom from coming. So we give you thanks for that, and I pray you continue to give us wisdom and grace um, as we meet together today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So let's just take uh, 10, 15 minutes, okay?
Testing one, two. I'm so sorry. Can't believe that. Can you hear anything now? Testing one, two. Are you able to hear that? Yeah, you can hear that? Okay, it was just the mic. All right.
Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming back together. I <clears throat> uh, want to remind you that there is a, a table with books on it back there. And those, those books belong to me. But if you want to borrow one, please just t tell me. Um, you can take it home with you and read. Those, all of those books are uh, helpful resources for thinking through some of these issues. That's, that's what I'm buried doing all day, every day, is reading all these books, trying to figure out how to lead this church. So uh, anyway, uh, my friend Bill Novak is here. He is um, he's, uh, ordained in the United Methodist Church as an elder um, in the Mountain Sky Conference. He's just transferred over here to, to Illinois Great Rivers and just moved in, bought a house in Washington. And so he's in the neighborhood now. But I've asked Bill, he studied a little bit uh, out of a different angle of things than I did in the seminary. And so I've asked him to say, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm just uh, asking him to say a few words uh, about his own reflections on uh, the question of transgenderism, which is related to this. That's the T in LGBT. So he's just going to take a few minutes on that, and then we'll dive back in. Thank you. Thanks for having me here, Greg, and thanks to uh, all of you. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, pleasure to be in Illinois again. Uh, uh, I'm originally from Montana, so, um, but my wife is from Michigan, so we kind of met in the middle, coming back, coming back closer to, to, to her family. So um, I wanted to affirm, I was, I was going to talk about um, transgenderism um, and, and what uh, I studied. Greg and I met uh, when we were PhD students at Garrett Evangelical. Um, he was doing Wesleyan history, and I was doing moral theology in the area of uh, well, philosophy and theology of technology and moral ethics. Um, and so coming at it from a little bit different angle, but uh, hopefully it complements one another. Um, but before I begin that, I wanted to affirm, because we actually, in the Mountain Sky Conference, went through this four, uh, five years ago now, uh, in 2016, when Bishop Karen Oliveto was elected to uh, the episcopacy to being a bishop uh, in the western jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church. Um, I always, I never know how many of you are cradle Methodists and know all of the terminology I'm using and how many of you maybe stepped foot this church three months ago and have no clue. Uh, so we're, we're divided and Greg's actually once illuminated my understanding of what Methodism is, but we're, we function much like the United States, right? Uh, we have basically and essentially a Congress, that's our, our general conference. We have a judicial branch, and we have an executive branch. That's our bishops, our judicial branch, there's a judicial council. And we're split up regionally as well. So uh, out, in the, out in the West, we're part of the Western jurisdiction. It's out of those jurisdictions that the bishops are elected. So in the Western jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church is typically seen as the most uh, on the left politically and theologically uh, of all the jurisdictions in the whole denomination worldwide. And it's out of that jurisdiction that Bishop uh, Oliveto was elected. Given that, I was in Wyoming. Uh, my last appointment was at First United Methodist Church in Cheyenne, Wyoming, which is a very conservative part of the country and conservative part of that jurisdiction. So it was a bomb that went off in our church. And we are a microcosm of the denomination, that 50, 5347 that Greg had up here. That was our local church. That was First Down Methodist Church. Um, uh, and it was a larger church, about 1,000 members. Um, and it was devastating. The reason I want to bring this up is because if we had done the, this process before the bomb, we would have been a lot better off. So the bomb went off, everyone's in shock, and then we started screaming at one another. All right. It's your fault that this is happening. No, it's your fault this is happening. Right? And so we lost a third of our membership in 18 months. Um, and, it was, and it was on both sides, too. Right? This is a tragedy. Some of them have stopped going to church altogether. Right? So... And that is, to my mind, you know, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about the scandal. Uh, and Christ himself talks about, better watch out if you're a pastor, because if you, if you stop the little ones from coming to me, you're doomed more than all people. 
And I felt like we did that as clergy members by not, in that conference or anywhere, talking about this with the congregations prior to things happening so that they had a good understanding and were already willing to talk to one another in dialogue. So we had to do that kind of as a catch-up in all church meetings. And it got started out with acrimony, but I would like to think by the time three or four years later down the road, for those of us who stayed, that it actually got to a place where we could grow. Because we found out that we could live with disagreement about this particular issue, but what we really wanted to identify as a local church is what we did agree on, what we wanted to proclaim to the community of Cheyenne. And then we started seeing growth in that church, prior to the pandemic, of course. <laughs> but, but, right, so once we were sure, it actually gave us an opportunity to articulate who we were, and we came up with our little pithy little slogans, we are gonna leave the world behind, and all that acrimony, and these incessant cultural wars where we're at one another's throats constantly, and we are going to be Christ followers here in this church, proclaiming the love of Jesus Christ and the resurrection, the good news of the Lord. And once we did that, man, we had an identity. People knew who we were. And so I, I just think it's a great that you guys are doing this now because hopefully it's, you find out who you are for the people of Glassford that you can tell. And let the culture people do their thing. They want to fight to the death anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we're here to, to love one another in Jesus Christ. Um, so anyway, I wanted to put that as two cents, and that's totally independent of what I was about to say. One of the things I think that works really well here is that Greg and I are like ships passing in the night, kind of theologically and politically. I grew up in a very liberal, leftist uh, congregation, even though we were in Montana. Um, and I was politically on the left for most of my life, and I found myself kind of theologically and politically drifting rightward. And Gray grew up in a very conservative, uh, evangelical uh, uh, world, and he's moved this way. So it's been kind of nice, and I think that's uh, part of what, what helps. But what I've learned from doing that is to not be so, to have some humility. I could be wrong. So that's why I want to preface my words about to say about uh, uh, transgenderism and, uh, um, and how we should think about that theologically. I could be wrong. Let me say that. I could be wrong about this. What I want you to think about first when you start thinking about transgenderism, and I want to separate that actually from the L, the G, and the B. I actually think they're two different things. Um, lesbian, just as a short sh shorthand on this, you can think of lesbian gays about being about who you love, right? who you want to be married to, who you want to grow a family with. Right? That's one issue. Transgenderism, so that's who you love. Transgenderism is about who a human being is, who you are. Right? So who you love and who you are. That's two different questions, right? two different answers to those questions. They have some overlap, but I think they should be seen as two different things. And the way that we understand who we are as people is dependent upon our culture, because our culture forms us. We do never come into our identity of who we are independently. We're not blank slates, right? We come from the culture. And I would like to say that transgenderism is a product of its culture, and that is the culture of technology. So what you're gonna, uh, yeah, that doesn't make any sense, right? Right. We tend to think of technology as being a set of instruments, right? A set of tools. I use my phone to call people. It's a tool of communication, right? Uh, I use my he heater as a, a tool to heat the house, right? But really it's, it's more of a way of seeing the world. For instance, do you know how many times that you'll turn on and off your light in, in your lifetime? takes up three months of your life just turning on and off a light. <laughs> Not very often, yes. <laughs> right? just, just, just doing this motion, if you live for 82 years, that's three months of your life doing that. Right, pretty weird, right, to think about. Who here today drank coffee? 
Who here today cut wood to, to heat up the water, to boil the water, to drink the coffee? No one? Did you? Okay, this is a, not today. Okay, so this is a guy living he, for himself back 50 years at least. All right. All right, so, uh, so drink coffee, no problem. Who here drove to this church? Who here mined the oil or drilled for oil to get? No one. All right, all right. Who here used their phone today, their smartphone today? Do you know how many times you touch that in a day if you're an average user? It's a terrifying number of 10,000 times. That's just the hour, and the hours are crazy, but this alone, right? Okay, so that starts to shape who you are and, and what you, how you see the world, right? Okay, so when I go over to the light switch and I flick it and nothing happens, how do you react? Frustration, mad, yeah, it's, it's not working. How do you think the first person in the world who ever saw that would act? Wow. Right? Do you even notice it? You don't even notice it unless it's not working. Because technology inculcates expectations. That's going to work. Right? I will have light. I will flick, and lo, there will be light. Right? So technology you could think of as a, as a pattern. More than a set of tools, it's a pattern, a life pattern, right? So who here, when they get sick, um, gets antibiotics if you need it? Do they expect to get the antibiotics? Do you expect them to work? Right. They better. Yeah, yeah. So the average life expectancy in 1900, does anybody know what it is? 40. 40. In the time of Christ, only one in five people made it to the age of 20. Changes your expectation. Technology changes your expectations of what life will do and what you should expect, how life will unveil itself to you. So that when my daughter gets sick, I have four. God help me. When, I, when my daughter gets sick, right, I expect her to get well. Do I expect her to die? No. No. In fact, it would be a scandal if she did, right? Somebody would be at fault, right? Okay. So it slowly starts to change how we see and view the world because what technology does is takes raw material, right, and fashions it into product. Antibiotics, and good things too. Lights, antibiotics, food, heat. It's wonderful. It's liberating. We start to see the world as a place of liberation. No longer am I tied to a particular place. Average American now changes their job and locate geographic location five times in their life. At least five times. Unprecedented, never happened before in human history. Okay, so it liber it, you could think of the technology as finally uh, what we think of as total, it offers, so we think, total liberation. So if you've heard of transhumanists before, for example, in the Silicon Valley, their final goal is to liberate human beings altogether from death. Now we have, it's, it's strange, right? But they really believe that's going to happen. So, what, else, who, what other kinds of movements have such a total definition of what liberation is, including how we should view death? Religion. Technology and its movement is, in some sense, religious. It's what we pay, place our faith in. Right? So the 19th century mother, when her daughter gets sick, she gets on her knees and prays to God. Save my daughter. 21st century mother, daughter gets sick. Does she get on her knees and pray? Why would you? I'm going to go to urgent care. OK? 
okay? So this is a way to see, and I'm not saying technology is bad. My wife is a type one diabetic. She's a true bionic woman. She walks around with a computer on her hip and it keeps her alive at every moment. Without it, she would be dead, as were all people without insulin up to the year 1918 is when insulin was invented. So everyone that had diabetes prior to then just died. So liberated, she's liberated from that, right? And we get to have a family. Hallelujah, thank you God. But, as with all things, uh, there's a very famous Spanish aphorism that goes for like this from the 16th century. I think it encapsulates this whole thing. It goes, God, <clears throat> take what you want, God said to man. Take it and pay for it. So there's a price to pay for it, is take it. And part of it is the way we understand and see the world and who we are. So it's easy to see the world as an accumulation of resources, right? I look at the trees and I no longer see it as beautiful scenery or the place where I work, but the possibility for a resource. Right? I look out over where I was in Cheyenne, Wyoming, I look out at all the beautiful fields, and I look at it as oil. Right? I'm not saying that's bad. It's made of oil. Your bones are made of oil, partly. And it brings true liberation. But it becomes so easy then to see that is a resource, that is a resource. Resource, 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 resource. In fact, when you're having trouble at work, wh where do you go? What does that say about our understanding of what humans are? <laughs> Human resources. We see ourselves as malleable, raw material to fashion in the way we would want. Okay, does that make sense? Now we can move to transgenderism. What is at issue with the idea of transgender? Is the fundamental I idea that I can take this raw material and fashion it the way I would want. Right? There is no givenness to anything. It is solely a matter of how I construct it. Does that make sense? So when we see trans, that's why I say transgenderism is a product of its culture. It believe, now, whether or not that's right or wrong, that's a long discussion, theologically speaking. What, I was try, what I'm trying to lift up for you, though, is where did the phenomena itself come from? It came from its culture that sees the world as fundamentally malleable to fit desire. All right, so I'm going to leave it there because uh, we could go on and on about that. Are there any questions? Can I take a question, Greg, if there's any I wasn't clear about? Okay. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for sharing. Appreciate that. Okay, well, what I want to do um, is to introduce you to sort of like how... I'm, I'm going to let you in on like how theologians work, okay, and how we think about an issue like this. Uh, the other day I was talking with Marv after church about woodworking, and um, I was trying to remember the name of the tool that you mentioned to me, Marv. Do you remember the name of that tool? Maybe a, router? a router? Yes, that's what it was. Yeah, and I, I think I asked if you had a lathe, and you don't have a lathe, right? Correct. I was, that's the only thing I, the only word I know about woodworking. <laughs> so I, I, I had to put it out there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now I know too. <laughs> so, so right, woodworkers, they have their tools. And, and, and in order to fashion what they want, they use these tools. Well, in the same kind of way, a theologian, uh, when presented with a tough question, has to go to their toolbox and to use, use the main tools they've learned to work with. And, um, and we have, as Wesleyans, as Methodists, we, we believe that there are really four key tools in our toolbox for discovering sort of the answer to our questions. Um, but I'm curious if any of you would try to name any of those tools. When, when we have a tough question about who God is, about how we ought to live our lives, what do we turn to? What do we look at? 
There's the, there's the first one. Scripture. The Word of God. That is tool number one. So I'm glad you guys all said that one because that's the very first tool we, we turn to. Bev? What would Jesus do? Very good. Which is a, it's a theological question. And of course, the way we learn about who Jesus was is through Scripture, right? So, good. Okay, prayer. Now, yeah, prayer definitely. I'm going to expand that just a bit and, and, call, and call it experience, okay? And here's what I mean. Um, we believe that God can speak directly to our hearts through prayer, that we can have experiences with God, or that maybe something will happen in life um, that we learn from and experience, and that God has somehow communicated to us through that experience. So that, that's, a, that's a second tool. Um, any guesses as to what the other two tools might be? Okay, very good. So church or pastor, and what I'm gonna, I'm gonna say is use this word petition, which I know it, it's a little different, but we are part of a tradition. We are part of a church that has, like I was telling you at the beginning, you know, it, in America, it has been here since 1784. Right now, that is a very valuable tradition. Ultimately, though, ultimately we're not Methodists. We're, we're Christians, right? And that's the most important thing. So we have the Christian tradition of 2,000 years of, of church history of, of the saints who have gone before us. Though that tradition helps us to, as a tool, to understand uh, the answers to tough questions. Um, one other tool. Anybody want to guess? Our, our good old brain. I'm going to say reason. Reason. Okay? We are, unlike the animals, we as humans are able to think through complicated things. We're able to use the reasoning brains that God has given us to try to understand things better. I think, therefore, I am. That's what, that's what uh, Descartes said. Uh, so reason is another tool. Now, what I've just put on the board here is, is what we call the Wesleyan quadrilateral, which that's a fancy term, I know. But uh, a, quadrilateral, a quadrilateral is just a four-sided object, OK? And as, uh, as Methodists, these are the four tools that we turn to in trying to discern the will of God, and trying to understand uh, how we ought to live our lives, um, all, of those, all of those huge questions. Scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. Now, there's a little bit of debate among Wesleyan theologians as to are all of these four equal, or are some like more important than others? Okay, um, And here, here's what I want to just say about that. Um, and that's a, that's a big question. We could spend a lot of time on it, but we won't. Um, generally, uh, more, conservative, uh, more conservative traditions place a higher emphasis on scripture and on tradition, generally speaking, okay? So uh, if you go to a, uh, a, a fundamentalist Baptist church, okay, and it's very conservative, their final authority is going to be the Bible and the church, okay, tradition, the, the authority of the church, right? Now, generally speaking, for those who are more kind of liberal or progressive, um, the emphasis is going to be put large, a little bit more on experience and on reason, okay? Now, here's the thing. Um, all four of these are super, super important for us. And um, as a theologian, what we have to do is decide uh, which of these are we going to place the greatest emphasis upon. Now, I just want to share a little bit about my own story um, before we go, go any further. I was raised, uh, and some of, some of you will know, know some of this already. Um, I was raised in a conservative evangelical home uh, down in Springfield, Illinois. My father is a pastor in the Free Methodist Church, and, and I get asked a lot, what's the difference between a Free Methodist and a United Methodist? And I'll just put it this way. Um, it's 
Free Methodists are just a, a bit more conservative um, on, on some issues. So uh, I noticed the other day when I, when I told you all that I liked the Godfather movie, and, and I said that my grandmother would be rolling in her grave, that you all kind of looked at each other like, like why, would, why would that be an issue? Well, for Free Methodists, you're not supposed to watch movies that have that much violence and have that much profanity, okay? So that, that's, that's an example, all right? Um, and, and I want you to know that I deeply value and love my tradition. I love my parents. I love my grandparents. I love the fact that I'm a, a sixth generation ordained pastor in the Methodist tradition. Um, it has shaped me from the moment I came on the scene. And uh, there's nothing on earth that's going to get me to just chuck it all and to, 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 or to pretend as though it's not important because it's very important to me. Um, but I was raised with the belief that scripture, more than anything else, is, is the key way that we understand God's will. Okay? If the Bible, if I saw a bumper sticker a few weeks ago. It said, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Okay? Right? Like, it's just kind of straightforward. You know, the Bible says it, I believe it, uh, that settles it. And I was raised in that, and I understand that, and that's a reason. So in the Free Methodist Church, we have what's called Bible quizzing for young people, uh, where they'll memorize parts of Scripture, and then they'll go to tournaments and, and uh, have competitions on it. And trust me, it's a whole thing. It's a whole culture. And I got really, really into it. And by the time I was 18 years old, I had memorized about two-thirds of the New Testament if you can believe that, uh, from, that from being in that program for eight years. Um, so scripture is super important to my theological method, to my understanding of how we go about the process of, of, of understanding God's will. Um, and so, I, but having said that, uh, it, it won't surprise you, being raised conservative evangelical, I was taught that homosexuality is without question a sin. It's not, it, it's not something that God looks kindly on. Um, and so um, I believed that. I believed that deeply. And uh, I remember even as a teenager, um, guys, guys can be kind of cruel um, to, to other guys, especially if they're not oriented the same way. And I remember with my friends, we'd use uh, the F-A-G word to refer to those others. Okay? I'm not proud of that, and I have since changed that my, the way that I speak. But this is the culture I was raised in. I didn't know any differently, and, and I just believe that those people are sinful, and that, you know, they, and I also thought that they choose to be that way. Okay? I really thought that. I thought they, that's, that's, that's just a choice. They don't have, those boys don't have to like boys. They like girls, but they some reason they just want to like boys, and I thought it was a, as a choice. Well, uh, however, I will say this on behalf of my parents and on behalf of my community: I don't think that it was a homophobic community. Okay, just because we believed that that being gay, that acting uh, on homosexual impulses was sinful, doesn't mean we didn't believe they were human, or didn't believe that they were they were valued by God. Um, I was taught that Jesus died for everyone and that, that God loves everyone. Um, and so uh, some who are kind of on the left will look at conservative evangelicals and say, well, they're, they're homophobes, they're, they're just homophobic. And that's when I stand up and say, well, hold on, let's talk a little bit about what you mean about by saying that. Um, do they, I was taught, uh, you, you've probably heard this before, I was taught you, you hate the sin, love the sinner. You've heard that before? You hate the sin, love the sinner. And you know what? In most ways, I would say that's a very, very good summary statement. That that's true. Because when we read scripture, and when we look at our, our church tradition, we find a God who does not tolerate sin, who punishes w wickedness and evil doing, but who at the same time is always asking for people to repent from their sin, to come out of it to something better. Right? I still believe that. I still believe that. The question, though, becomes, you know, of course, is having a homosexual orientation sinful or not? Um, and is acting on it the sin or not, right? So where, where I was for a very long time is this. Um, 
It's true homosexuality is a sin. That's clear from scripture. But the Bible teaches us that we're all sinners and that we all stand in need of God's grace. And I'm supposed to love the sinner even if I don't love the sin, okay? I'm supposed to love and include gay people and befriend them and not treat them like second-class citizens. Um, I, I, was, I was horrified by the, by the Christians from, where is that church down in Florida, that they would hold signs saying, God hates F-A-G's, okay? And, and it, it, even as a conservative, that horrified me. I could not believe anybody would, would, would be that, that hateful. Um, but having said that, it didn't mean that everything they did was okay. I couldn't believe that. I had, to, I had to stay faithful to scripture. Now, my thinking on this started when I was in college. I went down to Greenville College, and I was, I was the college conservative. Um, I, I, in fact, I was the Rush Limbaugh of my college campus, if, if you can believe this, okay? I know, cringe, that's fine. Please don't throw any tomatoes at me or anything. Um, but I was really into conservative politics at the time, and really, you know, and I, I loved, uh, and so I became the radio host of the first ever college uh, radio show on our campus, and it was a conservative political talk radio show. So I owned the label of the Rush Limbaugh at Greenville College. Um, now, and, I, and that's okay, shake your head. I'm not a fan anymore. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you know that. Um, but when, when I was down there, um, there was a student who wrote an editorial to our college newspaper that he called... He, he titled it, Stay in the Closet. And he wrote about how uh, it, it, was, it was not a very kind, it was, it was a rather hateful uh, letter to the editor that they decided to publish, and that was controversial, uh, where he basically just said, look, if you're gay, whatever, just don't let me know about it. Just, just stay in the closet. Well, as you can imagine, on a college campus where there are people of all sorts of different orientations and political beliefs, this really stirred the pot. And um, a lot of people were very angry and were writing letters in response to it. And the editor of the newspaper came to me and said, Greg, you're, um, you're kind of known for being an opinionated conservative. I wonder, do you have a response to this, this editorial, Stay in the Closet? And so I thought and I prayed about it for a long time. This was really the first time I had to think carefully about what am I going to say publicly about the issue of homosexuality. And, and I, I ended up writing um, just a simple piece saying that I have my own sins, my own habits, my own hang-ups, that I would be, frankly, I, I wouldn't want everybody to know them about me. And, um, and I guess that makes me kind of like the gay guy in my, in, in, at the college in the sense that I have things that aren't perfect about me. I have sin, and I stand in the need of grace. And so my, my kind of final editorial was just, yes, homosexuality is a sin, um, but we're all sinners. We all stand in the need of God's grace, myself included, and I will stand next to my gay friends um, in the face of this kind of hatred that, that they're receiving. And it actually really shocked the, the college community. They, they were expecting something a little different. I did not compromise on my belief that I thought that homosexuality was sinful. But I was just wanting to point out that it's not as though there's one sin that trumps all the other sins, as we've already talked about, right? Um, but that, that got me thinking about it. That was 20 years ago. Got me thinking uh, really hard about this. And, and that was, by the way, when I stopped using that F-A-G word. Because I, I was starting to think, you know, maybe we just classify people. This is the way humans act. We just, this is how racism works, too, you know? Those people are different than us, and it's easy to demonize them, to think of them as evil, and to think of ourselves as the good people. Well, we have to, we have to work against that. Anyway, I became ordained in the Free Methodist Church, as you all know, and the Free Methodist Church is a conservative denomination, and they have a conservative stance on homosexuality. They have a sense that's in alignment with the traditionalists in the United Methodist Church. Um, and I defended that position. But I'll tell you, when things really started to change for me a bit, was when we had a visitor to our church in Indianapolis 
who was quite obviously and quite openly gay. And he, he came to services seeking a spiritual home because he had been really hurt and really battered by a lot of religious people. And uh, he'd also, he didn't fit in very well with the gay community either because he was really devoutly Christian. And so he didn't really have a home. And so he would come every week. Um, and, you know, when you're up there and you're, preaching, you can kind of tell when people are tracking with you or not. Uh, sometimes, you know, people be nodding off, that's normal. Uh, but then you can tell when people are zoned in and they're with you. And this man, week after week after week, was hanging on my every word. And sometimes tears were coming to, into his eyes. And so I just started having conversations with him and talking with him. And he shared with me about some of his story, about some of, you know, some abuse that he faced as a child. And and, and all of this. And being the pastor to this man, it started to change me. Because I started asking myself, do I want him to feel as though he's a second class citizen in the church? Well, no, obviously I don't. I struggled though, because I didn't think that his behavior was consistent with Christianity and the scriptures seem to be against, against homosexual behavior. But we became friends and I prayed with him and we met together, and I'll tell you what, when you develop a friendship with somebody, that makes you think. It's hard to demonize people when they're your friends, and when you're sharing a meal together, and when you're praying together. And he knew what my position was. He knew that I'm a, I was a free Methodist pastor and that what our position was. And I told him, look, I won't ever be able to marry you to another man in this church. Um, that's that's not something, even if I wanted to, I couldn't do it because I'm bound to the book of discipline, to following these, these rules. Um, but privately, he would ask me, he would say, so in, in your opinion, Pastor, am I just supposed to be celibate my whole life? Should I not have a sexual partner? And I told him, I hate to say it, but yeah, that is what I believe. I believe you're called to just be celibate. So what I believed was that, that it's not the orientation that's wrong, okay? Um, and I want, even, even for those of you in here who may be traditionalists, I want you to understand this. Um, people are born with a proclivity to a, be attracted to same sex or, different, or, or a different sex. Um, and this is uh, part, of, part of our, part of what falls under experience is, and, and reason as well, is, the, is that we can, we can learn from science. We can learn from the scientific findings of, of those who research. And we have, uh, scientists have taught us that being gay is not, it's not usually a choice that people have. It's an orientation. That is, it's something that they're born with. They're, I didn't have to be told to be attracted to girls. <laughs> it just happened. All right, like I got to a certain age and I knew what I was attracted to, okay? Well, there are people who they didn't, they weren't, they didn't decide I'm gonna be gay. They just, they got to that point in life and certain things attracted them, okay? Now that, I think we need to think about that, okay. Well, if people are oriented this way, um, should we call it sinful or not? And I'm, I'm just wanting to raise these questions, telling you my own story. So here's, here's another part of my story that you guys already know a bit about, is that also while I was a pastor in Indianapolis, I started, I got dependent on opiates, okay? And I've shared this with you before. And I couldn't quit them. I couldn't stop doing it. Now, it wasn't good for me, and I knew it wasn't good for me, but it was something that I couldn't change for a long time. God has delivered me from that. Thank, thank God for that. But it, it, got me for, it forced me to start thinking about, like, what if there are things about yourself that no matter how hard you try to change them, you can't change them? You're stuck. And I think that in the church, a lot of gay people have probably felt that, felt that way for a very long time. Dang it, I wish I could be straight. I, I, I hate the fact that I'm attracted to other men. And, and 
and then the church has told them that they're, they're sinful for that. And it's led to a tremendous amount of, of suffering. And so let me just say that as a pastor, it, it changed me to be a pastor of a gay man. It helped me to think through these things. Um, I'm still a work in progress myself in terms of thinking all of this through. I don't believe that just anything goes, okay? Um, I do believe God gives us guidelines for our sexuality so that uh, we can have the most robust and healthy uh, relationships and most healthy society. Um, and one of the strong arguments for the traditionalist side is that children need a mother and they need a father. And so that's one of the reasons that traditionalists will give for, for defining marriage as only between a, as a mother and a father. And, I, and one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, um, do, do we believe that? Or do we believe that, it, that it's acceptable to have uh, two fathers or to have two mothers? Um, that's a relatively new phenomenon in our world. We, mo most of us did not grow up in a world in which it's possible to have two dads at home. Um, and, and so anyway, the, the only other thing from my own personal story, I, and as you know, I'm straight. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm straight as can be, and I have always, always have been. Um, but um, it was, it, when, I, when I hit a real low after my divorce, um, I, I started turning to some spiritual writers for comfort and for guidance. And one of my favorites that I've, I've quoted from many times in church here is, is a man by the name of Henry Nouwen. Henry Nouwen was um, a Catholic priest who was celibate all of his life, uh, supposedly. And um, he wrote some books that have helped uh, just scores of people. Um, his writing really touched my heart at a time when I was deeply wounded and helped to heal me. And Henry Nouwen was, I came to find out later, he was gay. Uh, through some of his private letters and writings that came out after his death. But he was closeted and he was celibate, okay? But he was a priest and he was gay. But one of the things that I learned, that it, how it touched my life, is that I had been deeply ministered to in a profound way by a homosexual. And that made a difference to me. I saw a vibrant faith, a, a, an eager faith within his writing. And he was gay. And so you just have to deal with that. And then when I moved up to Chicago and I, I met some other gay folk who were involved in their churches, and churches that were actively growing and reaching new people, and there was a vibrant spirituality and a vibrant Christian life among homosexuals. What do we do with that? How, do, how does that compute? And, um, and that also just kind of nudged me or maybe complicated things a little bit more in my mind. And so coming just to the end of this personal section, I just want to say that, that here's, here's where I'm at. Okay, I'm putting my cards on the table now. I would say that, that I am still not 100% certain about either, either side, but that I lean in the progressive side. I lean towards the affirming side um, because of my own work on understanding scripture, experience, tradition, and reason. I'm not at 100% on that, and I still have my questions, and I still have my doubts, but I lean in that direction. And I want, I share that with you, with my congregation, so that you know exactly where I'm coming from. Raise conservative, understand the conservative way of thinking about it. I understand the traditionalist kind of, uh, of objections. And, and I want, if, if we would, we may have uh, another meeting or two after this, but I wanna go into depth on the scriptural, scriptural passages. Because for most conservatives, that's really where it, that's really where the whole battle is fought, is if the Bible's against homosexuality, well then we as Christians have to be against homosexuality. And, um, and we're gonna go into a little bit of depth on what does the Bible actually say about it and, and what doesn't it. But I want, I, I want you to know that I am committed to being your pastor whether or not Glassford United Methodist Church agrees with my position. You understand what I'm saying? Um, 
I, it's not my way or the highway. And that, that's, not, that's not what I'm going to do. But to be honest with you, I would say I'm about 75% on the affirming end of things and maybe about 25% still, still traditionalist. Now, when I was up at Garrett Seminary, which is a very, very pro-LGBT um, institution, and I said that very same thing. I said, well, I think I'm mostly affirming, but I still have about 25% of doubts. Um, I got yelled at. <laughs> okay? I got yelled at. Because, and this is the way the polarization works. You're either with us or you're against us. It's 100% or 100, you know, or 0%. And, and it's, it's so sad. That's the way our, isn't this just the way that our society is now? We've, we've divided into tribes, and if you don't uh, sign the dotted line on absolutely everything your tribe says, well, then you're a traitor. And, and, and so, anyway, um, I have been in conservative circles most of my life. I have been in very liberal circles. What I want to see happen is for us to be able to unite under a common love for Jesus, a common desire to seek the Holy Spirit's guidance and, and for us to learn how to, how to love one another in spite of deep differences of opinion. And that's, that's really my aim. That's really my goal. So when, I, when, I, when a young woman, when one of my stu graduate students at Garrett, she was kind of going on a rant against the traditionalists, against the conservatives. Uh, this was shortly after that 2019 February General Conference. Uh, you know, I could tell she was mad. I could tell, you know, she identified as bisexual, and so, so she was mad. She took it as a personal affront. And, but she said, um, I don't think the conservatives even think that we're human. They don't even think of gay people as, as, as human. We're subhuman to them. And, and I said, wait a minute now. <laughs> I know a lot of conservatives, and I've been one most of my life. And... I don't know any of them that would say gay people aren't human. Well, that was me trying to build a little bridge there to help them understand each other, and that's when I got yelled at. Um, <laughs> that's, just the, that's just the way it goes. Uh, it's, not, it's not an easy job to try to be a bridge builder. And if you guys have ever tried this, if you've got family members on opposite sides or whatever, it is a tough job to try to say, okay, I hear what you're saying, I hear what you're saying. Can we, can we reason with one another? Because a lot of people just don't want to do that. They don't want to reason about it. They, they kind of, they'd rather yell. They'd rather yell, and they'd rather just have their, have their demons um, that they can fight against. Um, and, and so anyway, I guess you could say I'm a bit of a moderate, but I do lean towards the progressive end. And I want you to know that as your pastor. That's not going to impact the way that I uh, serve you as your pastor. And if you disagree with me, I'm still going to love you and pray with you and have communion with you because what we really believe in is that core, that central part of the lordship of Jesus, okay? That's the foundation of the church. All of this stuff, frankly, that's dividing the United Methodist Church, it, it angers me because it's, it's a little bit peripheral. And, and the core stuff, that's what we have to focus on. That's what we agree on. And that's what makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, so um, let me take a bit of time. First, real quick, I, that's just me sharing my own experience and journey. Um, uh, by the way, the, I think the thing that finally convinced me to sort of um, to, to go public with the fact that I was affirming or on the affirming side was a book that I have back there on the table. It's called Covenant and Calling by Robert Song. Not a very long book, only about, I think, 120 pages. Um, and it is a, written by a conservative Anglican with a very high view of Scripture. I have a high view of Scripture. I hope that comes through in our services that we have with one another. I have a very high view of Scripture. Um, and he also had a very high view of tradition, of, of church tradition. But his book is about why he thinks we've come to a point in history where we as a church need to reevaluate our understanding of marriage. Um, an understanding that hasn't changed in really 1,600 years. And let me say this. I do not, as a historical theologian, I do not sign up for those changes lightly, okay? My default position is to go with what the church has handed me. 
and to trust what the church has handed me. I do not just willy-nilly try to reinvent my faith. And by the way, this is why I don't really fit in with a lot of progressives, because there are a lot of progressives that kind of want to play fast and loose and just reinvent everything. And, and, I, and I'm s sitting here saying, no, I, I, we have 2,000 years of people that have thought and prayed and worked through scripture. We can't just throw that away. Having said that, we believe that the church always has to be reforming, always has to be able to change. It can't just simply get stuck in one period in human history and, and not move along with, with the rest of, of humanity. So, okay, let me just, let's just take a bit of time. Are there any, any questions before I go on to the next, next thing? Any thoughts? Or, yeah, Amy. Oh, yeah, that's not really deliberate on, on my part. Um, I, would, I would include, there's uh, QIA, I think. It's, it's long. I'm just kind of doing shorthand. Yeah. Although I do think that if we got into really great depth, there, as Bill was saying, there might be a difference between transgenderism and homosexuality. And, you know, maybe we'll go there at some point. But anyways, I just use that as a shorthand. Okay. Yeah, sure. Any other thoughts or questions? So I understand that probably most of you were raised in churches that were conservative on this, right? I mean, that's, that's been the position of the church for a very, very long time. Um, the question that we have before us is, were they right or are they right in 2021? Um, and, and that's that's something that I want us all to be praying about and asking the Holy Spirit to guide us on. But what I want to do for the rest of our time, we don't have a, a whole lot longer. I just want to go into a bit about the scripture because that really is sort of where the whole battle is like won or lost is in trying to interpret scripture. Um, just a question. How many times do you think that the Bible mentions the subject of hell in total. You can just throw out a guess. 25. 25. Any other guesses? 100. 100. Any other guesses? Okay. The answer is 162. So you, you were close. Okay. Yes. That's <laughs> I think the price is right now. Um, Ah, you're right. See, I guess we're playing on my home turf, huh? <laughs> I hear you. Okay, so 162 times the Bible mentions hell. How many times do you think the Bible talks about money? Jesus talks about it more than almost anybody else. Yep, yep. Okay, the answer is over 2,000 times. Over 2,000 times the Bible talks about money. Now, how many times does the Bible talk about homosexuality? Two? Good guess. If you, if you kind of stretch it uh, to the furthest extent, it's, it's seven. Seven times. Okay. Now, I just want to make a point right now that if we're committed to the authority of Scripture, and I am, then maybe what the Bible prioritizes, we ought to also prioritize. Okay? If the Bible is going to devote over 2,000 verses to the subject of how we spend our money, and only seven to the subject of homosexuality, then let's think about our priorities, okay? Th this is what I would say to the, the general gathering of all the United Methodists, if I had the pulpit. I would say, you're fighting about something that the Bible doesn't even think to be central, okay? Now, um, so there are seven times, 
And I, I, I won't go into great depth, Two, but, but here they are. Two of them are in Genesis, okay? Genesis 9 and Genesis 19. Uh, both of those, I, I, was, I was going to have us like actually read the, the passages, but instead I'll, I'll send out to any of you interested what these seven passages are. Or if you're interested in this, there's one book back there called the seven, the seven texts or the seven passages, something like that. But uh, so two of them are in Genesis and they refer, uh, and by the way, let me be clear, all seven mentions of homosexuality in the Bible are negative, okay? They, they, they all are spoken of as a negative thing. But in the Genesis passages, uh, homosexuality is mentioned twice. Then in Leviticus, there are two more references. The Leviticus 18.22 is very often quoted in these debates. And it's a, it's a simple, um, it basically saying that it is an abomination for a man to lie with another man, okay? So the Leviticus, these are the, the codes for the Old Testament for the people of God, uh, the Hebrew people. And, and, and so Leviticus mentions it twice. That's all in the Old Testament, just those four, four times. And then in the New Testament, there are only three references to it, okay? Um, in 1 Corinthians and in 1 Timothy, it's listed in a sort of long list of sins, all right? So Paul sometimes does this where he, he writes adulterers and, and fornicators and drunkenness and carousing and homosexuality, okay? So it's in this list of long sins in those two cases. And then there's the, the, the final, the whopper of the verses is in Romans chapter 1. And that is where the debate often really hinges, is in Romans chapter 1, where Paul talks about homosexuality there. I want to actually read that one for us so that we know, we know what we're talking about. And, because I, and I want you to know, I, I take the Bible very seriously and have a very high view of its authority. And so um, that's why I, I want to devote time to understanding what scripture actually says about homosexuality. Um, let me read this. This is uh, Romans 1, 26 through 27. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way, also the men, giving up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. All right. Um, it's, it, it seems very clear from, from that passage in the book of Romans that Paul considered uh, homosexuality in his day to be, um, to be a sin. So what are we, we going to do with that? Um, for many uh, conservatives, this just kind of ends the debate. Um, the Bible says it, I believe, and that settles it, that kind of thing, right? But let me remind you that scripture is always interpreted, always. There is no, no way of reading the Bible that's not an interpretation. And I'm not just trying to play fast and loose with you here. I could, if we had time, have you look up some other verses in scripture and ask you if we, if we take those literally. So for example, in the Levitical laws, it says any, you should never, um, you should never wear clothing that sews together more than two, uh, uh, more than one type of material, okay? So there's, if, I don't know, this is probably cotton and polyester or something, all right? Now, I'm not trying to make fun, but I'm saying that we don't follow that, right? None of us, none of us think of it as sinful to wear, you know, a, a, a cotton polyester blend, but there's a Levitical law about that. There's laws in the Old Testament about uh, mildew and and about, um, well, there's laws about if women are menstruating, they need to leave the, the community and go outside of the town until they're, fun, they're, they're finished menstruating, then they can return into the community. You know, some very, very strange practices that we do not follow as Christians. Um, 
and, and, and the reason that I bring this up is because uh, we are always trying to interpret scripture, trying to understand what part of the Bible is still applicable to us today in this moment, 2021, and what part of the Bible maybe was important for them at that time and in that culture, but that we have now changed our interpretation of it. You understand what I'm saying? Um, so the question becomes, just because Leviticus 18.22 says that homosexuality is evil, uh, does that mean that all the other, um, you gotta go, Bob? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what do you say? Oh, gotcha. <laughs> Thanks for coming today. Thank you. You bet. Um, so, uh, just because the Bible has it in there, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we always take it literally, okay? Uh, and that's a very important point. So we as, as Christians, we don't ever read the Bible just us and interpret the Bible for ourselves. It's the church's book. It's the church that compiled the Bible. You know where the Bible came from? The Bible came from the church, putting together its most holy and trusted texts and letters and compiling it and then all of us agreeing this is what we consider to be Holy Scripture, all right? So the Bible is something that we must interpret with one another, and that's why people uh, devote so much of their lives to the study of Scripture and, and to studying how to interpret Scripture. Um, so let me just, since, since I'm short on time, I promised you 11.30 be our end. Um, let me just put in a nutshell kind of the, the nature of the debate over Scripture and homosexuality. The, the revisionists, or those who are affirming, will, are going to make the argument that when, when Leviticus condemns homosexual behavior, when Paul condemns uh, uh, men exchanging natural relations for unnatural ones, what's really, it's not necessarily talking about covenanted, monogamous, committed relationships. You hear what I'm saying? So. So homosexuality, as Paul is fighting against in Romans 1, was rooted in a particular culture, a particular time, where homosexuality was, was rampant in the context of abuse of power, okay? The Greco-Roman world that Paul lived in, it was very common for a man who was a master to sexually use his slaves, all right? Whether it be female or male, it was very common. Pederasty is the word. Pederasty refers to an adult male using a boy uh, sexually. And that, clearly, I believe that Paul saw as an abomination, as something that Christians cannot be involved in. But the issue there was the abuse of power and the abuse of authority. You hear what I'm saying? So in the first century, there wasn't they wouldn't have even really been able to conceive of this idea of two adults consenting together to enter into a covenanted marriage relationship. It just wasn't in their world. It had never happened before. And so the affirming side is going to argue, and I think that I agree, although I still have my doubts, but I think that I agree that uh, scripture, what it's really condemning here is um, is the way that homosexuality was, was being used in Paul's day, which is um, adults misusing children, masters misusing slaves, um, that kind of thing. It was the abuses of power behind the homosexuality that was really um, the, heart of, uh, the heart of the sin, I guess. Now, we can... I want to leave a little time for us to talk about it, but that, that, is, that is kind of going to be um, the argument that, that people on the affirming side make. It's really helpful. One thing that's really instructive is to just think about how the Bible talks about slavery. Okay? Now let's think about that. It, the Bible mentions slavery a total of 326 times, and um, all but two of them, so 324 of them, either condone slavery or accept it as a part of the status quo, as a part of the culture that, that they lived in. And yet, of course, today, nobody needs to be persuaded that, that slavery is 
a sin and unbiblical and against the will of God. Well, why is that? It's because scripture is interpreted. It's interpreted. And, um, and by the way, all of these references to slavery that we find in the Bible, why are they there? Well, they're there because that was the world the Bible was created in. The Bible reflects the culture of its day. It, it, it reflects the, uh, that doesn't mean that it's not authoritative for us. God still uses it to speak to us. However, um, slave owners in the South in the 1850s, Bible-believing, God-fearing Christians, constantly pointed to scripture and said, look, the Bible, the Bible seems to think that slavery is okay. And they were actually kind of right. If we read just the plain sense of the text, the, the Bible doesn't denounce slavery. It doesn't condemn slavery. It just sort of accepts it as part of the world. Well, then we as Christians have work to do in terms of being led by the Holy Spirit towards new interpretations. And I could make an argument built from scripture that if we look at Paul's teaching about love and about how in Galatians Paul says that in Christ there is no longer male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, that we could make an argument that actually the Bible's pointing in the direction of slavery no longer existing and of people being equal with one another. It's not difficult uh, to do that and that's what we, we all believe. But this is I'm, what I'm trying to point out is that if we simply take the plain sense of scripture and don't think about how it's interpreted and how it was shaped culturally, um, we can easily be misled to, to draw wrong conclusions. So let me just say in a nutshell that if I really had to put the argument simply, I would say I think the question of same-sex covenanted marriage relationships is just not really even dealt with in scripture. Okay, in the 21st century sense that we are talking about today, that the authors of scripture wouldn't have understood that, and they wouldn't have had that in mind, and that when Paul is condemning homosexual behavior, it's, it's because it's tied up in this whole network of problems. And by the way, in Romans chapter 1, the main point of that chapter isn't actually about homosexuality. It's about, he uses it as a kind of example of what happens when a whole culture go, uh, rebels against God. When a whole culture stops worshiping the creator and instead starts worshiping created things and everything and the wheels fall off and everything goes awry and then what you find is horrible things like men abusing boys um, for their own sexual gratification uh, which is something that Paul is clearly against. So I think I'll save a lot of the rest. I, I have a lot more that I could say about scripture and I didn't really even get into reason, tradition, or experience. Um, but let me just ask you if there are any, any questions or thoughts. I've tried to just kind of give, give you the arguments sort of in a nutshell and I know that they might be rather new to you um, but wanted to, wanted to at least put it out there. Any thoughts or questions? Yeah. That's right. Although I wouldn't say all interpretations are equal. Oh, okay. I, I, I agree with you. There are but some. I, but, I, I think but I see what you're saying, yeah. And that's sort of like, um, that's a fear I have anytime you're listening to someone and say, well, can you just interpret it the way that you want? And then 
So that's, that's why I, I pointed out that, that Wesley and quadrilateral is so important for us because uh, it's not just scripture alone. And a lot of people think that way, that the Bible is our, only, is, our, is our only source for understanding God's will. Well, that, that would be tough if it was. Um, but these others, uh, reason, tradition, and experience are ways that, that help us to interpret the scripture correctly for our own day. And so, um, yeah, I've, been, I've gotten into, like, Bible ping-pong matches where you, like, you know, you give me a verse and then I give you a verse and, and we kind of go back and forth to see who has the most verses that support their opinion. And, and that's kind of a, a novice way of having these kinds of debates. Um, it's true that people can misinterpret Scripture and, or, use, or twist Scripture towards, towards all sorts of ways. But this is why it's so important that we do it as a community. Because as a community, when we think together and pray together, that helps, helps us from sort of like veering off into really, really strange territory. And, you know, there are examples of people who've taken a verse out of the Bible and started cults <laughs> and started, you know, their own churches out of it because they've got, they've got the right interpretation of it. Um, but we need, we need all of these to inform, uh, I believe. And this is why I like uh, that I'm a Wesleyan, why I like the Wesleyan quadrilateral is we use, we use all of these as a community to try to determine God's will for the future, if that makes sense. Yeah, Bill? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see. I see. Well, you're not alone on that. You're not alone on that. And, um, but yes, the Catholic Church has a very, very high view of tradition. And because of that, they, they're very slow to change on certain things. They still don't ordain women, for example. Can you believe that? Really? Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> sure. I'll tell you, so as Methodists, we do, we believe that God can speak directly to our hearts in prayer. And that doesn't mean that we can nullify scripture or anything like that. But so uh, one of the men that I wrote about my dissertation was a, was a, he lived back in the 1700s and he believed that slavery was biblical and, and he had slaves because um, he saw in the New Testament that Paul didn't condemn slavery. So he, but God gave him a vision one day of, uh, it was a vision of, a, of an angel he believed that said, said to him, uh, freeborn, you must set your slaves free. And, and, and it was that experience that changed him so that he, he liberated his slaves. And Methodism largely became an abolitionist movement against slavery because we believe that God can, God can reveal new things to us, new things that we've been blinded to in the past, that we haven't been able to see before. And it's like the scales can fall from our eyes and all of a sudden we can see, oh, okay, you know what? God's will is something different than I thought it was. Um, I, I, I just believe that that's why I'm, I'm, I'm urging you all to spend time in prayer. Because I, I believe that the Spirit can speak to us when we, when we genuinely seek God. And to say, and, and I've been wrestling with it for 15 years, but to say, okay, it seemed, some people are telling me this, other people are telling me this. How do I discern it? Well, going to that quiet place with the Lord can be one way, that experiential way, that we come to a, a greater understanding of God's will. So there are a whole lot of issues here um, that we could get into, but I, w I do want to respect your time. I'm wondering, though, if, if maybe a month from now, uh, I just hosted another one of these, would you be willing to come and attend? I see some nodding. Wait, what's that? Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so maybe September or something. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you, Kim.
thank you very much. That means a lot to me. It really does. Yes, Mara? So both of these narratives are told in the final act. And in my view, it's formed by early dreams. Mm -hmm. So the people that really passed it up there are drunk and they say it's really good. But that's not the way they came to live with their children. That's a that is the concern, uh, right? I mean, we want to hand on the best form of the faith that we can to future generations. And I, I want to be clear that, that by saying that I'm affirming, I'm not saying that everything goes. Um, so the question is, can two men who are sincerely devoted to the lordship of Jesus covenant with one another to be in a relationship for the rest of their lives in a monogamous relationship um, and can God bless and sanctify that that's where the rubber hits the road in a sense so if you know w we would have accountability measures for uh, a heterosexual man if he started having multiple sexual partners or or an alcoholic, if he falls off the wagon and starts drinking again, the church would, would have ways of saying, oh, no, no, you've crossed the line there, and that's not good for our church. That's not good for our children. You know, we do believe, I, I still very much believe things, right? Um, it's the question being more one of, of uh, should the church sort of sanctify and bless same-sex marriages or not? And I think that that's a question that's kind of a new question. Um, that I don't think Paul was had in mind necessarily when he was writing about homosexuality, if that makes sense. Yeah, Bill? Yeah. Um, and, and so we lost that, that spiritual wholeness part of the United Methodist Church, where we focused all our time on these large social issues and no time on these huge flaws that have happened. On being people of integrity and looking at ourselves in the mirror. Yeah. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm with you on that, Bill. Um, and, and so I urge all of us in the time ahead, um, by the way, I mean, take a, take a book or whatever from the table if you want to do some extra reading. If you want to have a personal conversation with me about it, I will make time for that. Um, I really am wanting to guide us through stormy waters as best as we can. Uh, I've laid my cards on the table, but um, if you disagree with me, we can we can still we can still uh, love one another, and and we can still have conversations with one another. Um, thank you guys for coming today. Oh. Um, before you go, though, if you would, um, Jenny, would you be willing just to hand these out so everybody gets one? Um, so if you go on, if I was a traditionalist, <laughs> and if I was a traditionalist, <laughs>
As Bill was saying, I think that this is better for us to be communicating than to just have a bomb dropped on us and then have to pick up the pieces afterwards, you know? So um, you'll see on this little survey, this is not an official vote. This is just for my knowledge. This is preliminary. And, um, but I just kind of want to catch the pulse of where this congregation is at, and uh, it'll help me. Um, and feel free to write any questions or comments. Um, and then uh, if you'll just uh, pass this around, I suppose, and just put them in, put in there. No, no names, no names, no names. Can you just tell us the outcome of this sometime? I may do that at the next session. Yeah, would you be interested in that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Tony. I think I'm a little bit too young. I don't know what you said. <laughs> uh, the next time I give a talk at the city, the first thing we should say is how we are very happy to do it. And we'll get all the students to come up with it. Oh, I know. It's, it's a, uh, well, that's, that's an op obviously a horribly devastating thing. Um, in the, in the creed, when it says the Catholic Church, it's, it, it's Catholic with a little c, and, and it just means the universal church. So it's not actually the Roman Catholic Church with a capital C. It's, it's Catholic as in, I believe, in the universal church. Yeah. But oh, those are, yeah, yeah. The, Let me, uh, let me. Yeah, yeah. Were you okay with my side hearing it? Okay. It is a lot to think about, and I understand that. We, we can do that. That's the, that's the struggle we're going to come up against. And there are going to be people on both sides that way. That we, well, I'd, I'd never go to a church that's affirming. Or I'd never go to, I've, I've heard also, well, if you won't marry gay people, I would never go to your church. I've heard it on both sides. And that's, that's we have a lot of people worshiping with us on Facebook these days from other communities. And some of them will send me feedback. And they'll, they'll ask me, like, where do you stand on this? Um, you know, and I want to be able to give them a, a, an answer for the, for the, on behalf of the congregation. So let me just say a word of prayer as we end our time together today. Gracious and loving God, we, we come before you as, as a congregation of your children wanting to know what your will is. We pray for wisdom. We pray for guidance. We pray that you would, you would give us compassionate hearts and that you would give us sharp minds. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be faithful to your holy word. Help us to respect and revere the, the fathers and mothers that have gone before us in the faith that they've handed down to us. Help us as the Glassford United Methodist Church to be a city on a hill, a light that shines in the darkness for the sake of those who may be suffering, who may be experiencing chaos and disorder. Lord, give us guidance. We want to be a faithful, a faithful group of your disciples. Help me as the pastor of this congregation to lead with wisdom. We pray for the, the, the larger and wider United Methodist Church around this country and throughout the world. Help us, Lord Jesus, to most of all just be known for our love for you and our love for one another. We give you thanks, and we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for your...